Hello lovelies, thanks for joining Hearthside Story Corner. Today we will be voyaging together on the cruise of the Little Dipper by Suzanne Langer. So sit back and enjoy this animated story with me. Once upon a time, there was a very poor boy, who had no cap on his head, no shoes on his feet, and never a penny in his pocket. He was so poor that he did not even have a name. His father had gone to sea many years ago, in a ship called the Big Dipper, and as he had never returned, people said surely he must be dead. So the boy had gone to live in a small, dark house beside the sea with his great-aunt, who was very old and cross and strict. She did not let him have any sugar on his cereal or butter on his bread, and every day after school she spanked him soundly for all the mistakes he had made that day. And if he had not made any, she spanked him just the same, for all those he would probably make tomorrow, or the next day, or the next. When he asked for a bit of soap to blow bright soap bubbles, she cried, Soap bubbles indeed! Soap is made only to wash one's face with. You may have all you want for that, but for bubbles, no, no! Bless my boots, what will you ask for next? When the other children played on the beach, building castles in the sand, or picking up pretty shells, this poor boy had to gather driftwood for his great-aunt's kitchen fire. But for all his hard luck, he was always whistling blithely at his work. He would whistle all the tunes in the hymn book, and all the sailor songs, and the nursery songs, and then some more that he made up as he ran along the beach picking up driftwood. Of course his great-aunt had forbidden his whistling about the house. But other people liked to hear him, and since he had no name, they called him Birdling. His great-aunt called him, You! One day, after he had come home from school, washed his hands, eaten his dry bread, and drunk his tea without sugar or cream, he went as usual to the beach to gather wood. But this day, all the boys from school were down by the seaside making sailboats. Their mothers and aunts and grandmas had given them odd bits of muslin from the rag bag for sails, and their fathers and uncles and grandpas had given them little pots of paint. And the old boat builder who lived on the beach had supplied the nails and boards and no end of good advice. They were building a splendid fleet, and when Birdling came whistling along the sands, they all hailed him and shouted, Birdling! Birdling! Come and build a boat! We have nails to spare, and surely you have some nice boards in your load of driftwood. Come, come, and build a boat! So Birdling, forgetting all about his duties, and his great-aunt, sat down in the warm yellow sand and built a boat of driftwood, and while he worked, he whistled. The boys were all so glad to hear him and be able to play with him that they gave him all the paint and nails that they could spare, as well as string for his rigging and a lead sinker for his anchor. Of course, he had many kinds of paint and not enough of any one color to paint his whole boat, so her hull was black the trimming golden yellow, the deck bright blue, and the mast was green. She was a funny boat indeed, but Birdling liked her nonetheless, and wanted to name her after his father's ship, the Big Dipper. But she isn't big, said the other boys. She's the smallest boat of all. Thanks again, lovelies. That is the end of our story time today. Please like and subscribe to join me for part two of the cruise of the Little Dipper, coming soon, and have a wonderful day. Goodbye. ...that he did not need at all, for his great-aunt always patched them before they went into holes. If I didn't, she would say, why, bless my boots, he'd sit them through in two minutes. And now he did a dreadful thing. He took off the patch and used it for a sail. They had such a good time with the boats, loading them with cargoes of seashells, and digging harbors, and chasing away the crabs who came to watch, that they did not notice how the sun had dipped down behind the sand dunes, and the lighthouse brightened far out at sea. Suddenly, they heard the curfew ring. Why, it's past supper time, they cried, and all the boys snatched up their boats and ran home. In a moment, the beach was as deserted as the sea, and Birdling sat alone on the sands, his boat between his knees while the shadows of night crept down to the water. At the furthest end of the beach gleamed a dull square of light. That was his great-aunt's window, brightened by the oil lamp behind it. Oh, how she was going to scold him now, for this time he had really been naughty. 
He had gathered no driftwood. He was late to supper, and he had ripped the patch off the seat of his trousers. "'I don't dare take you home, little Dipper,' he said as he placed his boat in the safest harbor as far as possible from the incoming tide. "'My great-aunt would burn you in the kitchen stove. Goodbye, little Dipper.' His great-aunt met him at the door as he came home. She was so angry that her cap had slid over one ear. Her eyes were like tiny hot coals, and her very apron strings curled with wrath. She boxed Birdling's ears, smack, 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 until they were as pink as seashells. You, 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 she cried. You shall have no supper, sir, but a very good whipping. Go up on the hill behind the house and cut a switch, a strong one, a long one, for a long, strong whipping, sir. Obediently, Birdling went up to the hill where the witch hazel bushes held out their long, strong boughs to be cut for switches but somehow he could not find just the switch he wanted. One was not long enough, and another was too long, or one would not be strong enough, and the next too strong. He looked them all over very carefully. The witch hazel bushes were in blossom. There were fuzzy little yellow stars on their boughs. Birdling saw a bumblebee, who should have been in bed an hour ago, darting from bush to bush and tasting the little flowers. Then the boy remembered that he was to have no supper tonight, and as he felt dreadfully hungry, he touched one of the yellow blossoms and licked his finger that was covered with fine golden pollen, just to see what it tasted like. Behold, what happened to Birdling! He did not know that the witch hazel flowers were full of fairy bread. Suddenly he grew smaller and smaller, like a candle on a birthday cake, till he thought he must go out altogether. Before it was time to go out, he stopped shrinking and saw to his great relief that he was still a good inch taller than the bumblebee. He sat down with surprise, his hands on the ground and feet apart, and the short grasses closed above his head. All around him the daisies, who always enjoy a joke, were tittering and looking at him through the grass. Somewhere behind a huge fuzzy mullein plant was a great noise, like the motor of an aeroplane. It was the bumblebee coming to see what was going on. "'What's happened?' he boomed in his rolling bass voice. "'That's what I'd like to know,' replied the boy, picking himself up. "'I never felt so small in my life, "'not even when I tore my Sunday shirt "'and my great-aunt scolded me before everybody. "'Why, I'm no bigger than a seahorse!' "'The daisies were still laughing, "'and now they could no longer contain themselves. "'He ate fairy bread,' they giggled, "'and he grew as little as a balloon when the air goes out. "'Ho, ho, ho, tee, hee, hee, hee!' Ate fairy bread, exclaimed Birdling. Do you mean to say I'm a fairy now? The bumblebee put his head on one side and deliberated. No, he said slowly. You are not a fairy. You're only fairy-ish. What's your name? I haven't any, but people call me Birdling. Well, that's not so bad. What can you do? Nothing. Oh, yes, I can whistle. Where will you live? You are too small to live with your great aunt. She would surely step on you. Birdling looked around. There was a ground sparrow's nest. Here, he said. If nobody minds, I'll live here. So that is where he lived all summer. Everybody on the hill grew fond of him. And in the mornings, when the robin sang to the sun, Birdling, too, would be up and whistling. But one day, the bumblebee came to call. His face was serious and his voice unusually rumbly. It was a cool day, so Birdling was all wrapped in a mullein leaf. It's autumn, said Bumble. What will you do when winter comes? I don't know. What do the birds do? They go to the fairylands. Mayn't I go? You aren't a bird or a fairy, objected the visitor. But I'm fairyish, you know. Then you may, I suppose. Birdling got up, ready to start at once. How do the birds get there, Bumble? They fly. But I can't fly. Then you can't go. But you said I could if I was fairyish. No, I said you might. You may, but you can't. See? Birdling shook his head. Where are the fairy islands? he asked. Beyond the deep sea. Could one go in a boat? Possibly. Then Birdling remembered the little dipper, lying forlorn on the sands beyond the reaches of the tide. 
Perhaps some boy had picked her up, or perhaps the waves had taken her, or perhaps she was still in her harbor. Neatly he folded some mullen leaves, for sailors need warm clothes and blankets, and with these over his arm he began the long journey from the hilltop to the harbor. It was ten fairy miles of rather rough walking. The bumblebee went with him, and when they had come as far as his great-aunt's house, which was just halfway between the hill and the beach, he flew up on her roof where you could get a splendid view of the country. "'Oh, can you see the little dipper?' cried Birdling from below. "'I see a boat on the sand,' reported Bumble. "'A very queer boat. Her hull is black, her trimmings gold and yellow, her decks bright blue, and the mast and sails are green.' "'That's the little dipper!' shouted Birdling, and began to run as fast as he could. He quite forgot that his great-aunt sat by the window, knitting wristlets and watching everything outside the house. She saw the tiny creature running along the beach, and as she was very old and could not see very clearly through her spectacles, she opened the window and leaned far out. "'It must be a mouse,' she decided, and hobbling across the room, she called her cat and opened the door for him. "'Mousy outside, puss,' she said. "'Go catch the mousy! Catch the mousy!' The big black cat never had much to eat, so he was very glad to go and catch a mouse. Poor Birdling dropped his mullen leaves and ran faster and faster, but could not run fast enough. The cat came nearer and nearer. "'Oh, I can't run any more!' panted Birdling at last. In another moment the cat would have pounced upon him and devoured him. But just then the bumblebee came booming through the air and stung the cat on his big black S-shaped tail. The cat gave a terrible cry, turned around and ran home three times as fast as he had come. Birdling had to sit down and rest for a while after the cat had gone. Then he and Bumblebee went on, hoping to reach the Little Dipper before noon. But they had not gone one half a fairy mile further when a cross, scratchy voice shouted at them, "'Get off the beach!' "'I can't,' said Birdling timidly. "'There's a board fence on one side and water on the other, "'and I can't go back the way I came because there's a cat.' "'He could not even see who was speaking. "'There was only a big brown hill in front of him. "'I'm not on the beach,' replied Bumblebee. "'I'm in the air. Who are you, anyway?' "'Who am I? Well, I like that. Who am I? Why, I'm me!' The big brown hill lifted itself up a bit, and they saw it was the back of a horseshoe crab. "'Get off the beach, you civilians! This is a parade ground! I'm drilling the new regiment from the deep sea!' Then they noticed a long line of little pink crabs emerging from the foamy water and slowly ascending the sands. "'Backward march!' shouted the horseshoe crab. There was nothing for Birdling to do but sit down on an empty oyster shell and wait until the parade was over. They marched backward and marked time with two feet, three feet, four feet, till they had learned to keep all six of them going, and they did squads right and left and exercised their jaws and joints and pincers. There was nothing they did not do. At last the horseshoe crab shouted, Dismiss! And all the little crabs tumbled back into the sea pinching each other and betting who would be first down the beach. Then the old commander turned his attention to Birdling and Bumble. Who are you? Nobody. Where are you going? I'm not going at all, replied Bumble. You want to cross the parade crown? Yes. What for? To get to my ship. Show your passport. Here, and Bumble unsheathed his shiny long bayonet. That will do said the horseshoe crab quickly, backing away a few steps and pulling in his tail. You may pass. It was night before they reached the little dipper. She looked very forlorn, lying a bit sideways, sails furled and decks covered with sand. Worst of all, a whole brotherhood of shrimps had set up housekeeping in her hold, and not even at the point of Bumble's bayonet would they move out. They wore little coats of mail that made them quite indifferent to a mere bumblebee's sting. "'But you must move out,' pleaded Birdling, standing on the deck and shouting down into the hold. "'I want to go to the fairy islands, and I simply must have my ship.' "'Going to the fairy islands?' echoed the shrimps. "'That's a long trip without food or water aboard and without a crew.' 
Oh, we'll lay in food and water soon enough, said Bumble, who sat in the rigging. As for a crew. Let us be the crew, cried the shrimps. We're not clever, but we're really very obedient and faithful. We don't want to spoil your trip, birdling, but we don't want to move either. There are very few houses along the beach and none as nice as this. Let us be your crew. But then I'll have to pay you, said birdling, and I have no money. Shall I pay you with music? I'll whistle one tune for every shrimp once a week. It's a bargain, replied the crew. All night long, Bumble flew to and fro between the witch hazel bushes on the hill and the boat upon the beach, carrying fairy bread and honeydew for the voyage. The crew packed all these provisions into big barnacles that made splendid kegs and barrels. Birdling was brave enough to go back along the beach by moonlight and pick up the mullen leaf blankets he had dropped when he fled from the cat. And at the crack of dawn the Little Dipper was ready to put to sea. They cleared the harbor and, with the outgoing tide, floated out upon the ocean. Bumble flew above the mast and accompanied them for several miles. Two fiddler crabs came to the edge of the beach and fiddled until the good ship was out of sight, and Birdling stood at the bow with the great green sail blowing behind him. At last everybody shouted, Goodbye! Goodbye! Good luck! Thank you! Thank you! Then the Little Dipper sailed out of sight. For three days they journeyed, always pointing their course to eastward, but they did not know just where to look for the fairy islands. Sometimes a flock of birds would fly above them, also going eastward, but they flew so fast that it was never possible to follow and learn their path. On the fourth day, just as the pink dawn spread over the sky, Birdling saw a whole fleet of tiny sails. They were no bigger than his own, but they were pearly white and shimmered with lovely colors, so he knew they must be Nautilus ships. Hey ho! he shouted, catching up to them. Hey ho! Hey ho! The Nautilus ships have deep, deep holds with many little cabins in them. When he shouted, a whole troop of fairy sailors came popping out to see who had called to them. Hey ho! they replied. Where are you going? asked Birdling. To the fairy islands! Take me along? With pleasure, said the fairies. Who are you? I'm Birdling, and the shrimps are my crew. The Little Dipper was surrounded by the ships of pearl, and as the sea was quiet and the wind very low, they could talk from deck to deck. The oldest one of the fairy captains was a brownie named Trick, who was seven hundred years old, and knew about everything from the North Pole to the Great Antarctic. We are going to the fairy islands with a cargo of ants' eggs, he told Birdling. Our king likes to eat them poached or fried or scrambled on his breakfast toast. We would do anything to cheer up the king. Why does the king need cheering up? Birdling inquired sympathetically. I thought kings were always happy. Oh, no, no, no. Our fairy king is very unhappy. His little son has been kidnapped by Shag. Who is Shag? Trick shook his head and rolled his eyes at Birdling's ignorance. What? You have sailed the sea for fully half a week, and don't know who Shag is? Ask your crew. But the shrimps did not know about Shag either. They were not very clever, you know, and had not gone to school. Won't you please tell us, said Birdling, a bit ruffled at the brownies' airs. Shag is the king of the deep sea, shouted all the fairies together, so loudly that the Nautilus ships rocked with the noise. He has kidnapped our little fairy prince, Trick explained and nobody knows whether he is ill or imprisoned or dead. Our king is so sad that he will not wear his crown. He has locked it in a closet and hidden the key. As for the queen, the poor lady has turned into a weeping willow. That's awful, said Birdling, and the shrimps were moved to tears. Where does Shag live? Under the rock where the sea lion sleeps. Can't somebody sneak into his house and take a peep to see what has become of the little prince? You make a shiver to think of it, replied the fairies, pulling their caps down over their ears and their sailor collars up. The sea lion wakes at the slightest noise and catches anyone who comes near, and if you did get by, Shag would be sure to see you and eat you at a gulp. But Birdling went on, asking questions. Where is the rock? We are just passing it, said a shrimp from the top of the mast. I see it far to leeward. Birdling turned his rudder and waved his hand as his boat swung away from the Nautilus fleet. 
Goodbye, he shouted. Tell your king that Birdling has gone to take a peep into Shag's palace to see whether the young prince be ill or imprisoned or dead. You shall not see me again till I bring word of your prince. The fairy set up a great cry of amazement, but already the little dipper was far too leeward, steering toward the terrible rock. So they continued on their way to the fairy islands, and all the way home they could talk of nothing but the adventurous captain of the many-colored sailboat and his crew. Birdling sailed straight up to the rock. It was black and high, and the waves ran upon it in great white ruffles. Then he noticed that the top of the rock was not of stone at all. It was the outstretched form of the sea lion, sound asleep. When the shrimps saw the monster, their courage failed them. They fell upon their knees and begged the skipper to turn back, for they were dreadfully afraid of being eaten, and when Birdling would not turn back, they mutinied and said they would not mind the sails and would not go one inch nearer the terrible rock. Then Birdling grew angry at their cowardice and locked them all into the hold, where their cries could not be heard, for he was afraid they would wake the sea lion. He then took the ropes and the rudder in his own hand and steered his craft into a cove so near the sea lion that he could hear the great creature breathing. In the cove and under the rock ran a deep cave that he guessed at once would be the entrance to Shag's palace, where you could go down into the deep without drowning, as the mermen and mermaids do. Very quietly he fastened his boat to the rock, then climbed on to the gunwale and dived like a dolphin into the deep, dark, ripply water. Yes, this was the entrance to the palace of King Shag. At the bottom of the cave was a winding stairway, like the inside of a huge shell. Strange, fantastic fish swam up and down and churned up the water, so that it was very hard for Birdling to keep his balance. But fortunately, they did not see him, so he crept on slowly down the steps. Suddenly, he saw a gleam of light, and he felt sure it must be from Shag's palace. Faster and faster he ran down the wet, mossy stairs, till a current of water caught him and took him all the way down just as a fly goes down the hole in a washbowl. When he landed at the foot of the stairs, he was sitting on golden sands, and the bright lights blinded his eyes. "'Why, what's this?' said a thundering voice in his ear, and a huge fin picked him up. He looked up and saw Shag himself." a huge silvery fish with long whiskers and pop eyes and a golden crown on his head. He was very hideous, and Birdling was terribly frightened, but he looked all around hoping to see the prince. I don't know who you are, said Shag, but you look as if you'd make a nice little morsel. I will let you have one chance for your life before I eat you. You shall come and see the wonderful treasures I have collected, and if you are able to pick out the most precious jewel in my vault, I will let you go. You shall have the jewel for a prize, and I will give you one day's grace before pursuing you with my soldiers. So Birdling was led down some more long stairs to the cellar of the palace, where shining jellyfish lights hung from the ceiling. In their dim radiance he saw a heap of treasure such as no one had ever seen in all the world, diamonds that shone like stars, rubies and sapphires and emeralds, brooches and necklaces, pearl-set combs, wonderful pins and lockets and vessels of hammered gold. Then Birdling noticed a queer locket lying close to his foot. It seemed to be made of two big oyster shells closed with a band of tin. There was nothing very precious about it. But it must be precious, or it wouldn't be here, he thought quickly. While Shag waved his whiskers in a bored and superior way, and his soldiers craned their necks to see Birdling, the boy suddenly stooped and picked up the locket. I choose this, he said, and held it up with both hands. Shag uttered a howl of rage. He has guessed! He has guessed! The bodyguard drew back in terror as their king beat the water with his fins, till a cloud of mud came up from the floor of the cave and his crown slipped over one eye. Now he would really have liked to eat up Birdling, but of course the soldiers had all heard the rules of the game, so he had to abide by his word. Birdling was escorted back to the hall and allowed to go up the winding stairs, back to the little dipper, the heavy oyster shell under his arm. It seemed to him about as big as a suitcase, but harder to carry because it had no handle. 
No one knows how he could have ever carried it to the top of the stairs had he not met a seahorse who gave him a ride. Hey ho, he cried when he stood once more aboard the little dipper. Are you asleep or awake down there in the hold? Awake, cried one voice. Asleep, murmured all the others. Then wake up, for we must flee. We have one day of grace, and then Shag will pursue us. Heave the anchors and hoist the sails. So he raised the trap door of the hold, and the shrimps climbed out, looking very shamefaced and small, as well they might. And in a few minutes, the little dipper was under sail. When the rock was well out of sight and the little dipper making good speed, Birdling gave the wheel to the first mate and decided to open the oyster locket. It took three shrimps and the captain himself to move the heavy band of tin that held the two half-shells together, but at last they fell apart. And what do you suppose was inside? A perfect little bedroom, all wrought of finest gold, with a canopy bed of rosy silk and a tiny chair and table and even a dresser, and in the bed on pillows of down lay the young fairy prince. When the locket opened and the light shone into his room, he rubbed his eyes and said, What time is it? Time to go home, replied Birdling. Don't be afraid, for we are taking you there. They gave him some witch hazel bread and a drink of honeydew, and one of the shrimps was appointed to tell him stories to pass the time. The young prince was cheerful and well-behaved, and everyone who saw him loved him at once. He had yellow curls and bright laughing eyes and clothes made of flower petals that made Birdling feel very plain in his rough coat of mullen leaves. Everybody aboard the Little Dipper was perfectly happy, so they quite forgot that tomorrow morning Shag would pursue them with his soldiers. Imagine their terror when they woke up at sunrise in a raging storm that made the waves dash over the very mast of their boat. They could hear Shag howling at the bottom of the deep sea, and as he whisked his tail, he made more and more bubbles and whitecaps come up. The whitecaps pursued the little dipper like ranks of horsemen. The young prince, hidden under Birdling's mullen coat, began to tremble and cry, for he was dreadfully afraid of Shag. "'Don't be afraid,' said Birdling. "'I'm sure we will reach the fairy islands very soon now, and then we will be safe.' "'But where are the fairy islands?' "'Where are they?' queried the young prince, scanning the sea with his bright eyes. "'I don't see them, and I am so frightened.' Birdling had just been hit on the head by a hailstone, but he pretended it did not hurt. "'You mustn't be frightened,' he said cheerfully. "'I'll whistle you a tune if you'll stop crying.' And he began to whistle as though he didn't mind the storm at all. As he whistled, the sea became calm and began to shimmer with a thousand lovely colors. And out of the rippling waters rose three snow-capped mountains surrounded on every side by sunny green plains. He had found the fairy islands! Birdling ran his boat into the harbor where he saw the Nautilus fleet lying at anchor, and he called out joyfully, Yo-ho! Yo-ho! Hey-ho! Where's Trick? A crowd of fairies came running to the harbor's edge and cried, Hush! Hush! No one is allowed to shout or whistle or sing on the island. Even the birds do not sing. The king and queen have commanded silence to prevail until they have some news of their son. Here's some news for you then, replied Birdling. Go and tell your king and queen that the young prince has returned. So saying, he picked up the fairy child and stood him on the gunwale of the ship for everyone to see, and the well-behaved child doffed his little diadem and bowed. So great was the joy of the fairy people that they stumbled over each other in their haste to go and tell the king that the good ship Little Dipper had brought back his son. The queen, who had turned into a weeping willow, came back to life and wept now with delight. The king hunted all over the palace for the key to his closet, for he could hardly wait to put on his crown once more and hold a great banquet in honor of Birdling, who had restored the heir to the throne. The birds burst into song and the blue bells chimed and even the butterflies, who are usually silent, began to trill and chirp until the whole island rang with joyous sounds. Soon as the cook could get the banquet ready, they all sat down and feasted, from the fairy king with birdling by his side, to the meekest under earthworm, and the shy shrimps had a table by themselves because they did not possess very fairyish manners. There was cake for everybody, and ice cream and chocolate with whipped cream, and candy and favors. The best thing about the party was that all the goodies were fairy food, which couldn't make you sick, however much you ate, and they all drank to Birdling's health in pink lemonade. Three days later, when the feast was over and the hundreds of golden dishes had been washed and dried, Birdling was playing on the beach with the fairies, and he saw a ship out at sea. Look, he said to his friend Trick, there's a ship just like mine only a hundred times bigger. 
That isn't a fairy ship. How do you suppose she came into these waters? Oh, that is a ship that came here long ago, said Trick. Shag caught it and tied it to the lighthouse rock. It has been there for years and years. I suppose the storm which Shag made when he was angry at you must have torn the rope and set the poor vessel free. Do you suppose the people on board are still alive? I'll go and see, said Birdling. Of course I'm very small, but I might be able to help them. So he took the little dipper and sailed out to the schooner. Hey ho, he cried, standing up and putting his hands to his mouth. Hey ho! Somebody certainly was alive on the ship. A tall captain dressed in oilskins stood up in the bow and shouted back, We are the Big Dipper! Who are you? The Little Dipper! And you must be my father, cried Birdling, dancing for joy. At first, the captain could not believe his eyes and ears, but when Birdling stood on his right hand, he had the good ship Little Dipper in the left one. He looked at him very closely and saw that it really was his son. Oh, father, now can we go home together, exclaimed the boy, hugging his father's thumb. But will you wait till I go and say goodbye to my fairy friends? Yes, I will wait, said the captain, for you should never leave your friends without saying goodbye and thank you. The fairies were sorry to see Birdling go. They let him take along all the treasures he wanted from the king's storeroom and helped him carry them down to the harbor and put them in his hold. He took a bag of gold for his father and a little one for himself, besides the oyster locket with the golden chamber inside which he had won from Shag, and a little pearly crown for his friend the bumblebee at home. He even took a gold thimble for his great aunt and a little silver bell for the cat to show that he bore no malice. And here is some fairy wine you must drink when you are safely aboard your father's ship, said the king, handing Birdling a tiny vial just as he said goodbye. It will make you grow up again and be as big as other boys. We will miss you, Birdling. Farewell. So Birdling, a life-sized boy once more, went home with his father, whistling happy songs. As his whistle died away in the distance, the fairy island shrank down into the water. The waves closed over them, and you could not even guess where the three snowy peaks and the green plains and sunny harbors had been, and no one has ever seen them since. The End Thanks again, lovelies. That is the end of our story time today. Please like and subscribe to join me for more weekly animated stories, and have an extraordinary day. Goodbye.